Hi, it's Dwyer. Always, 1776.com. Also, DwyerCrime.blog. Today is July the 7th, 2024. Let's talk about a murder case that has been in the news, right? It was tried. The jury came back with a hung jury. We'll see if they retry it. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just point out, because this is a murder case, the Karen Reed case out of Canton, Massachusetts, I believe protocol needs to be followed. Viewers should understand that the burden of proof rests with the prosecution. It's the prosecution that has to show guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Think of it like a chain. If there are any breaks in the chain, anything untoward, the prosecution will lose its ability to show guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is a very high standard. Now, were I a juror, for me, this case would have been cut and dried. I would have voted to acquit Karen Reed. In my opinion, the people handling the case made mistakes that they cannot correct. Some of the witnesses relied upon by the prosecution I simply don't find credible. Moreover, the physical evidence does not support the prosecution's theory. Now, the cop-on-cop defense argument seems to me to be the most credible theory of the case. Now I'm using a lot of to me and I thinks in this presentation. In America, I am entitled to tell you what I think about the evidence. For legal purposes, nothing in this video should be construed as factual statements about what actually happened. Now the prosecution's theory of the case contends that after a night of heavy drinking, 42-year-old defendant Karen Reed drove her 46-year-old boyfriend, police officer John O'Keefe, a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, to an after party hosted by another Boston cop that John O'Keefe had just met, Brian Albert, right, whose sister-in-law was a friend of John O'Keefe's. Her name was Jennifer McCabe. Another person in law enforcement, ATF agent Brian Higgins, convinced O'Keefe to go. Note that there are calls from Jennifer McCabe to O'Keefe, who was slow in getting to the after party. Jennifer McCabe claims today that she butt-dialed him. Now Karen Reed, who did not want to attend the after party, drives John O'Keefe to the after party, and the two agree that Karen will wait for a few minutes in the car, really an SUV, until John sees the crowd and decides whether he wants to stay. John gets out of the car. There is a snow blizzard outside. It is cold. John is wearing an Apple device that counts his steps. We now know that John's Apple device shows that he walked 80 steps, 80, after getting out of the car. Karen waits for a few minutes, and to her surprise, she does not hear back from John. Surprised and upset, Karen drives off. She is drunk from having had at least four drinks earlier that night in a bar where her and John attended before the after party. She texts John. John, I, my word, let's keep this PG. John, I effing hate you. She would send several dozen texts that night, including, John, you are effing another girl. Right? So understand, that night, 
Cameron Reed is sending some contentious text to John after she lets him out of the car to attend an after party, following heavy drinking at a bar. Now importantly, if you're a juror, witnesses Ryan Nagel and Heather Maxson testified that they saw Karen driving away from the home where the after party was being held. The time was around 12.30 a.m. Karen drives away alone. Now let's ask an important question. What happened after Ryan Nagel and Heather Maxson say Karen drove away at around 12.30 in the morning? The short answer, post-trial, is that we don't know. The people at the party never see her boyfriend John enter the party. But the party had different rooms. The main party was happening in the kitchen. The witnesses agree that ATF agent Brian Higgins and police officer Brian Albert left the kitchen and went to another room before John O'Keefe would have entered the house around 12.30 in the morning. So the patrons did not see O'Keefe enter. Also missing were Brian Albert, who invited him, and Brian Higgins, who insisted that he come. The dog, Chloe, was also missing. When O'Keefe's body is found outside several hours later, his arm looked like it had been attacked by a dog. Brian Albert and Brian Higgins made calls to each other that night. They are reflected in the phone records. Now the reason these calls are shrouded in secrecy is because both guys claim that their calls were butt dials. One of these calls lasted for more than 20 seconds. Brian Albert's call to Brian Higgins took place at 2.22 a.m., almost two hours after Karen Reed was seen driving off. Five minutes later, at 2.27 a.m., records show that Brian Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, did a Google search to find out how long it would take for someone to die in the cold. The search contained a typo. What she actually typed out has become a bit of a mantra for those who believe that Cameron Reed was being framed here. What she wrote was HOS. Now understand, on a keyboard, the letter S is right below the letter W. HOS, long to die in cold. But it's clear what's being asked here. Also clear is that this search, curiously, was later deleted. Supporters of the prosecutor now contend that the search took place on an app that Jennifer McCabe opened hours earlier that night. Jennifer McCabe is the prosecution star witness who claims that she saw Karen Reed's SUV near the residence much later than the 12.30 a.m. period when other witnesses saw Miss Reed driving away. Right? Just understand, the current claim is that the 2.27 a.m. notation is incorrect that McCabe opened up an app on her phone and then hours later when Karen Reed was looking for her boyfriend and asked McCabe, according to the current version, to look things up on a phone. She looked it up after 5 a.m. but because the app was open it reflected 227. Well, let me ask, what exactly happened at 222 a.m. 
when McCabe's brother-in-law butt dials somebody else, right, and 2.27 a.m., the time on McCabe's search for finding out how long it takes someone to die in the cold. Given that there is a dispute on whether we can believe either the phone record, because there's a claim it was a butt dial, or the internet record, because there's a claim there was an open app, doesn't that open the door toward what can we believe in this case? Also, are you a juror overlooking too much? If they show you the telephone records and then the prosecution tries to discredit the telephone records. No, no, that was a butt dial, right? One of more than one on this night, by the way. That was a butt dial. And hey, this search theoretically could have been done sometime other than five minutes after the butt dial. Now here's what we know. At least six people leave the after party. None of them see O'Keefe's body. None of them. Right? He's dropped off in front of the house. The prosecution theory is that Karen Reed then backs up over him. Right? Backs up, hits him, then drives off. Right, folks? His body's not in front of the house. We know that because six people leave the after party and don't see it that morning. Right? Let's talk about evidence that I personally find believable. A third party. Brian Lochran was plowing the snow that morning. He claims that there was no body on the lawn where John O'Keefe's body was later found. In addition, somebody appears to have moved a Ford Edge to obstruct the view of where the body was later found. Interestingly, when O'Keefe's body is found a little after five in the morning, it is missing its belt. Folks, it's these little facts that jurors need to look at and ask the question of how this impacts the prosecution's narrative. How did O'Keefe's belt come off of him? Who took it off of him? The medical examiner found that O'Keefe had few injuries below his head and that he had scratches to his arm that appeared to be dog bites. Now, the prosecution's theory is that John O'Keefe never made it to the house where the after party was held. The prosecution wants you to believe that a drunk Karen Reed deliberately backed into her drunk police officer boyfriend after she dropped him off. That the telephone evidence of calls between Officer Albert and ATF agent Higgins can't be trusted because both calls were butt dials. That the 2.27 a.m. Google search by Albert's sister-in-law on how long it takes to die in the cold can't be trusted because she did the search on an open app that put the wrong time for the search. That the snowplow guy is incorrect when he says there was no body there when he plowed the snow before the body was discovered that the family dog who the Alberts had for seven years and then gave away after the murders did not create any of the bite marks on John O'Keefe's arm. Rather, those injuries were actually caused by the car, not the family pet, who, of course, the family gives away after the victim's death that all of John O'Keefe's injuries were caused by being hit by Karen Reed's SUV. One wonders how an SUV backing up a few feet 
is supposed to have knocked the belt through the loops and off of John O'Keefe's pants. That the polycarbonate material on the taillight of Karen Reed's car, which was designed not to shatter, shattered into 47 pieces that were found around the body of victim John O'Keefe. That the film showing Karen Reed backing into John O'Keefe's vehicle in a driveway later that night, right, she drives to his house after dropping him off, right, doesn't fully explain the damage to the back taillight. That no cops participated in framing Karen Reed by shattering and splink, sp sprinkling taillight pieces of her vehicle around the dead man's body. Even though several cops, several, inspected the crime scene and saw no taillight pieces before 47 such pieces were found. That it is the impact of Karen Reed's SUV backing into John O'Keefe that caused his belt to disappear from around his trousers. That the Apple device that measured John O'Keefe's 80 steps, which are enough to make it to the house, after he left Karen Reed's SUV, was incorrect. That the chief inspector's failure to mention the snowplow guy in any police report was an innocent mistake or simply sloppy police work. Let's talk about the expert testimony. And let me just point out here, I'm surprised this case was even brought. The evidence seems so weak to me. Let's talk about the expert testimony. Two medical experts, Dr. Scheer and Dr. Russell, agreed that John O'Keefe's injuries are more consistent with a physical altercation or an animal attack. That expert testimony is inconsistent with what the prosecution wants you to believe. Let me also point out that the testimony of independent engineers Dr. Dan Wolf and Dr. Andrew Rensler, highly educated qualified engineering and biomechanical experts conducted their own analysis of the case and they concluded that John O'Keefe was not struck by Karen Reed's SUV. They believed that the SUV did not sustain any damage from contact with Mr. O'Keefe's body. Now let's talk about problems with the prosecution's lead investigator, Michael Proctor. I'm bringing him up this late because I need for viewers to understand that this case is weak with or without him. Right? The facts just don't add up or at least the prosecution's contentions. Now first, with regard to the prosecution's lead investigator, Michael Proctor. There is an apparent conflict of interest which hurts the appearance of fairness. The lead investigator knew the Alberts, right? The people who hosted the party. In my life as a divorce attorney, I've gotten a judge, highly respected judge, a judge who I had a trial in front of in a different matter, recused. In other words, taken off a case because he personally knew one of the parties. Right? That case is still pending, but that judge is no longer part of the case. Now here, the lead investigator, Michael Proctor, and the district attorney both initially denied that Mr. Proctor who was in actuality a close family friend of the Alberts, knew Brian Albert. The lead investigator had to later admit that he did. It raises questions for me about the credibility 
of any evidence that Mr. Proctor participated in collecting. If I were a juror, such evidence would not have much credibility. Is he finding whatever evidence exists? Or is he finding whatever evidence exists that would help his friend? I don't like the fact that you have a snowplow guy plow snow on the block where the death takes place and somehow he doesn't appear in a police report. How's that possible? Significantly too, the lead investigator did not record a meeting he had with the Alberts. In my opinion, this is simply shocking. Wouldn't a meeting with the hosts of the after party be of the utmost importance? How was that meeting not properly recorded? Now, if there is any hint that this lead investigator, the person who gathers the evidence for the prosecution, if there's any hint that he's biased in favor of a witness, a person of interest, or is simply biased against the defendant, then he should not be in that role. Again, if I'm a juror, I'm going to think that the prosecution in a criminal case has a very high burden of proof. I need to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know how you reach that threshold if the lead investigator is shady. Well, let me just point out that if there is any hint any hint that he's misusing the evidence he collected for personal gratification or for reasons not connected to the investigation, he should not be the lead investigator. Now here, the lead investigator told friends that he was searching Karen Reed's phone to find nude pictures of her. Folks, he's giving Karen Reed differential treatment because she's a woman. He's invading her privacy here. Not only that, he's bragging about it to friends. Talk about poor judgment. He told friends that he hoped Karen Reed committed suicide. According to the New Yorker magazine, Reed was, in Proctor's estimation, a whack job, four-letter word, that starts with C and ends with T, with a weird Fall River accent and no ASS. As Proctor put it, zero chance she skates. She's my word. Imagine the word he used. She's effed. He made these statements less than 24 hours after O'Keefe was pronounced dead. In other words, these are early conclusions. He hasn't even done the investigation. These are his early conclusions. In a case, of course, where the people who hosted the party happen to be family friends of his. So to sum up, I would have voted to acquit. I know it's a hung jury. I understand some jurors, at least one of them, voted to convict. I would have voted to acquit. When I hear there are at least three butt dials in a case, in which I don't trust the cops. And there are experts, plural, who doubt that the victim was even hit by a, an SUV. I would vote to acquit. That 2.27 a.m. Google search for how long to die in cold also bothers me. 
as, that a, as does a lead investigator who initially tried not to admit that he knew the Alberts. Folks, in a case like this, if you're the district attorney and your office has botched the case to this degree, and when there are experts out there who don't see damage on the car, who really can't give an explanation on how the guy's belt disappears, who wants you to believe in this case that the 80 steps that he takes on his Apple device weren't really 80 steps, you've got to have your doubts. So I can't believe the phone records. Those were butt dials. I can't believe the time on the Google search. Right? I should overlook the fact that the guy initially didn't tell the truth about knowing the Alberts. I should overlook the fact that this guy in 24 hours is, you know, talking about hoping that the defendant commits suicide. You got to be kidding me. How did this case make it to trial? Let me also say too, I'm bothered any time I see a case that's vastly overcharged. I hear about people at a bar drinking heavily. Then I hear that someone got hit by a car, right? I'm thinking sloppy driving. I'm thinking drunk driving, right? Let's just say, look at the charges here. The idea that they think Karen Reed did this deliberately, based on what? I don't get it. I would have voted to acquit. Let me hear from you. Tell us how you would have voted. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.